uh, the, a Navy ship that was going out in the ocean, they were in the Pacific Ocean, and, and, uh, and they saw an island, there was smoke coming out of one of, the, one of three huts on the island. And so the, the ship pulls up and they find a man who had been deserted on the island. And there are three huts lined up behind him. He says, I'm so thankful that you found me. And the captain of the ship comes off and says, well, uh, who else is here with you? He says, no, I'm all alone. He said, well, if you're all alone, why do you have three huts? And so the man looked around and he said, well, this hut's where I live. And that hut is where I go to church. He said, well, that's fine, but what's that third hut? Oh, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> <laughs>
I want the first point for you to look at today is what verse 12, Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you what? Love. love one another. That you love one another as I have loved you. And this is, oh boy, let me tell you something. And yes, if you get offended when a believer speaks out against the body of Christ, you're going to have some trouble today, all right? You're going to have some trouble because I think we need to do better. Uh, Christians do. Christians do. Uh, if you're not a Christian, then I think that when you look at believers, Christians, it's my hope is if you look at me as a believer and a Christian that you wouldn't see Matt, the very flawed man, but that you might be able to see past that to a Jesus Christ that really does love you. That's what I'm hoping. That's what I'm really hoping. In fact, Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And I think we're dropping the ball there, Christians. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, yes. We all drone together on that. Good. Good. We are. We are. And it seems like a simple idea. A friend should love you. I know that seems very simple. And yet, I think we all have lots of friends that don't really love us. That don't really love us. Here's the struggle. While you know that you're supposed to love your friend, a lot of people don't realize that you're supposed to allow yourself to be loved by friends. A lot of us put up these walls and we don't let people in. And we just push and push and push and push. And we don't let people love us. The struggle is to allow yourself to be shown love without feeling like you have to owe something to somebody. It's okay for somebody just to love you just because. That's all right. And I want you to hear that today. Jesus says to love each other like I loved you. How did Jesus love people? First of all, he loved us unconditionally. Romans 5, 8 says, but God showed his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God didn't say, I love you. Wait, you're a sinner? Uh, how bad? Like, <laughs> what kind of sinner are we talking? Are we talking like, you know, like the big three? Like, are we talking like murder, stealing, adultery, sin? Because we all know those are so much worse than all the rest of them. Or are we talking like little white lies? Like we all know that if your wife comes out of the bathroom and says, how do I look? No is not an option. Is that the kind of sin we're talking about? Or God didn't say any of that. God didn't say that. You know why? Because God doesn't have time for lies. Here's the truth. God loves you no matter what you've done. No matter who you are today, God loves you. It is not conditional <clears throat> upon anything you have done in your past. Good or bad. And that's important. That's important. Uh, last week, my daughter, who is five years old, came up to me. I was in the kitchen. And she came up to me and she had the, this look on her face. She really adopts this look anytime she thinks that I'm going to be able to give her something. All right? She has this look on her face. She comes up. And she says this, no matter how prepared I thought I was, I wasn't prepared for this. She says, Daddy, Mommy doesn't love me anymore. <laughs> Y'all find that funny? <laughs> so did I. She said, uh, Mommy doesn't love me anymore. And I said, uh, I said, I said oh, gee, well, that's not, I don't think that's true. Why would you say that? And she said she wouldn't let me have a Pop-Tart. <laughs> I said, I thought you had a Pop-Tart. She won't let me have another Pop-Tart. How many Pop-Tarts did you ask Mommy for? Five? I'm five. I need five Pop-Tarts. Sarah, Mommy still loves you. She doesn't want you to have too much to eat because it can make you sick. Sarah was equating her mom's love with getting exactly what she wants. We laugh at Sarah, who is five, about this. And yet, we equate God's love for us with getting exactly what we want. Mm -hmm. Now, we may not say it. We may not get it. When we, get, when we don't get what we want, we don't come out and just say, you know, God doesn't love me. If he loved me, I would have won the lottery by now. I mean, really. I play all the time. I would have won if God loved me. If God loved me for real, for real, I'd have had my pickup truck by now, all right? I'd have had a Corvette. All these things we say, oh, well, God doesn't love us. God doesn't love us. Now, we may not say it out loud, but we're saying it up here. We're allowing the enemy of our souls to speak those lies to us. 
And yet the Bible says that God loves us even though we're sinners, no matter how filthy we are. In fact, the Bible also says that even our righteousness is as filthy rags. Even the best things we do are dirty, and God still loves us. Now, I don't know about you, but I really need that. I really need that kind of love. We should continue to love each other in spite of our terrible mistakes. You know why? Because uh, I don't want to break it to you this morning, but none of y'all are perfect. <laughs> Not one of you. All right? And I know some of you tried really hard to look perfect this morning. All right? Now, I don't mean just your clothes, because some of y'all look sharp. But I mean, sometimes we get up and go to church. We get up and go to church, and we don't just put on nice clothes. We put on a nice face. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Oh, now we're really getting somewhere. Sometimes we put on that mask like I am. I'm looking good this morning with my clothes, and I'm looking like a super Christian on my face. We ain't smiled all week, but the minute we hit the door, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> like somebody clipped our skin back. And we're like, how are you? I'm fine. Life is great. My world's not falling apart at all at home. We put on these masks, these fake things, and we say, oh, we got to be perfect. We don't got to be perfect. In fact, God already knows you're not. God already knows you're not. And he does. Jesus loved us unconditionally. He also loved us with all hope. I want you to see this verse because this is, I know everyone loves John 3.16, and it is so important. It really is. I love John 3.17. John 3.17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now, here's what I love about that, and if you've ever heard me preach before, maybe you've heard this before, there's one word I like more than any other word in that verse, and it's the word might. Might. You know how much God loves you? There was no guarantee that you were going to accept his son as a savior. There was no guarantee you would even believe he exists, and still he did it. You can't change it. He did it. You might be saved. It doesn't mean might like maybe he'll let you. That's not what that means. Might is always conditional on you. It's your decision. We all have free will. You can do whatever you want. But just the chance that he might have a relationship with you was enough for him to give everything that was precious to him in, in, in all of existence. His son. His son. Jesus hung on the hope of a relationship that might happen. That might happen. Words we don't use around our house, and I want to share some uh, non-king words in our household. We don't use these anymore. We've learned not to. Here's the words. Might, maybe, and perhaps. We don't use those words with the kids anymore. You know why? Because if they ask, are we going to go to the park on Saturday, and we say maybe, it gets like Holy Spirit transferred somehow into their ears as, yes, that's definitely what we're doing, and I can't wait to do it. That's what the kids hear. If I say, maybe we'll go, they say, yep, yep, they, they said yes. <laughs> then Saturday comes and it rains, right? It rains and we're not going to the park. And they say, but you promised. <laughs> we went from maybe to yes to I, like, swear all that is holy within me, we're going. That's where the jump they made. Might, might. Sometimes we hear what we want to hear. We do. When we read this verse, John 3, 17, God sent, didn't send the Son of the world to judge the world. Well, first of all, sometimes as Christians, we just, let's just throw that part out because we like judging people real hard. That's really fun, right? Right? Come on now. Don't act like you don't like that. <laughs> oh, not me. The Bible says judge not. That's not me. I don't do that. Okay, save it. Uh, let's go back. Let's put, that, let's put that part back in the scripture, shall we? Uh, for God did not send the Son of the world to judge the world. He didn't come to judge the world when he came on the earth, but the world might be saved through him. Now, that is pretty incredible. You know why? Because it speaks to hope. And can I share something with you this morning? Real, true friends, never give up hope. Never give up hope. There are some people that have hope in you, and you don't even have hope in yourself. And they have hope in you. True friends hope, and it never dies. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 tells us about love. I don't know if you knew that or not, but it says that love... Never gives up hope. It never stops believing, right? It never quits. It never fails. It never gives up. Hope is always alive. Always. Here's the second point. We gotta live. 
Greater love has uh, no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And I know what this looks like. It looks like Jesus is saying the greatest love is one that you die for, right? I mean, that's kind of what it looks like. Now, is that true? Is, is it a great love, the one that you would die for? Well, that's what every romantic comedy has ever taught me, right? So that's got to be true. True love is one that you would die for. But that's not what this verse is saying. Can I share something with you this morning? Living your life for another person is much harder than simply dying for them. Living your life for that person is harder than simply dying for them. I thought about this and I thought, you know, I am less impressed. I know that there's this great love story written by William Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. You know that story? And I thought about Romeo and Juliet. What a great picture of love that people use and hoist up. You don't know the story? There are two warring families. And, and the son of one of those families, Romeo, and the daughter of the other family, Juliet, fall in love. And through these, this terrible, uh, just the this, this circumstances, they end up dying at the end of that play. Spoiler alert, sorry. They die. At the end of that play, they die together, in, uh, next to each other. Uh, they end up taking their own lives. It was very quick. It burned very hot, and it was over. I am less impressed with Romeo and Juliet than I am with the 90-year-old couple that pass away within six months of each other who have given their entire lives to each other, sacrificing again and again and again. Now, that's not always an attractive story, but that's an impressive story to me because true love is living for the other person. You know why? Because it means sacrifice. And that's not just, I'm not just talking about husbands and wives. I'm talking about friends should sacrifice for each other. Now Jesus gave his life for us, and I'm not just talking about death. I know Jesus is famous for death and resurrection, with good reason, by the way. But without the 30 plus years of living a life without sin, it wouldn't have mattered if he died or resurrected. He had to be sinless. It's the everyday battles that matter. Can I share something with you from experience? Where is gluttony fought? Do you know where gluttony is fought? Every single meal. For me, gluttony is fought after 9 p.m. every day. I, now, just stay with me. I don't know if any of y'all fight this or not. 9 p.m., like the kids go to bed, and I get in the bed, and you know what I want more than sleep? Oh, just absolutely anything that's bad for me, food-wise. Like, I start really, like, lusting. Now, you judge all you want, and I don't really care. <laughs> I really, I, I just want chocolate, whatever, I don't care, just what it just, I want it, and I want it now. I start fantasizing about Dairy Queen, and I, when I say fantasize about Dairy Queen, it's unhealthy. <laughs> and I don't care. I have an option at that point, okay? Now, I will go through some pretty extreme lengths to feed my sin. I got to tell you, okay? I will get out of the bed at 10 p.m. to drive to Dairy Queen to get a blizzard. <laughs> because they're as close as heaven to heaven as you're ever going to get, really. Unless you're, uh, some, unless you're going to heaven, that's it, okay? Or I can just squash that, squash that down, bury that sin, and just, and just go to bed, which is the right thing to do. For me, that's where the everyday battle is fought. I don't know how many of y'all are fighting that battle. Sometimes that's a losing battle. I understand, right? Uh, I have people ask me, say, oh, yeah, 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 I hear that you, uh, you're, you're working out with Jason Race. That must be really hard. And I say, eh, that's difficult, sure, but that's not really where the struggle is. The struggle is the food. I don't know if you know that or not. Eating the right things is hard for me. Where is gluttony fought? Every meal. Where is gossip fought? Anybody a gossiper in here? No, y'all are gossiping. Y'all are perfect Christians. Remember? We put on the masks. Um, where's gossip fought? Every single conversation. Especially the juicy conversations. Am I right? <laughs> Every single conversation. Where is greed fought? Every opportunity there is to give rather than keep or take. That's where greed is fought. Where is lust fought? Every single look. And every single thought about someone else's body, that's where lust is fought. And that's hard. It's hard. Sacrifice is the greatest evidence of love that one person can offer to another. I want to ask you, 
how are you at sacrificing for your friend? I saw something yesterday that, uh, you, ever, you ever see something and, and you see it and watch it happen and you kind of make up a backstory for it? You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh yeah, this is probably what's going on there. Let me tell you how. And, and as far as I'm concerned, this is 100% true. Um, I was, at the, I was at a Commonwealth Games uh, competition, watching a judo competition, and they had these, uh, I was there to watch adults uh, fight each other, but they had these little bitty guys come out, guys and girls, and go against each other. And it's fun watching them, like, go out and, like, tug on each other and throw each other to the ground. And I'm like, I should really sign the boys up for this, because they fight at home for free for nothing. And like, maybe this will get out of their system. And so I'm watching them do this, and I'm watching... Now, th there were these little bitty kids. I'm talking like five, six years old. They were tiny. And they're out there, and they're in their cute little geese, and I'm a dad, so I'm like, oh, this is adorable. And I'm watching them, <laughs> and I'm watching them pull tug on each other and throw each other to the ground and all this. And I'm watching this one match, and there was this blonde-headed boy, and uh, he was really tiny. Uh, and he was, uh, he was competing against this, this girl uh, with, with a long ponytail. I'm watching they come up to each other. And, and, and they're adorable, first of all. And then they, the, the, the sensei, the, re, the, the referee, puts them together and they go in and they're, you know, and they look like, you know, street fighter, like Mortal Kombat style going in on each other. And they roll in on each other and they grab at each other and it's adorable because they don't know half what they're doing, kind of. I mean, I should be fair, they could probably both take me. But uh, they're up there and they're grabbing on each other and they're pulling and tugging. And I watch as the girl gets a hold of the boy and is able to put her leg out in front and then twist her hip and put all the weight there and drop him like he was nothing on the ground. Now watch this. Why is that funny to y'all? Violence on children. Y'all really need prayer today. So the little boy jumps up off the ground and, 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 and he was disappointed, but he was really, really cool about it. Like, I would have been upset, I think, but he was much better. And so he, he gets into the mat, and they, and they bow to each other, and they bow uh, again when they back up, and then they leave the mat, and as they leave the mat, the girl goes over, and she celebrates, she's excited. And Luke, boy, I watch him from the bleachers where I was sitting, and he walks over to what I think was his father, to who I think was his dad. Uh, and so he was a bigger guy, and he's just, and his, when he gets over, he was disappointed. He wasn't, like, crying or anything like that, but you could see he was disappointed. He thought he could have done better. And I went way over to his dad, and his dad's there, and his dad just had, like, the biggest smile on his face. And just gave him this big high five, and that was awesome, and just this, like, congratulate. Again, I'm making up all of this speech. I have no idea what he was saying. But I'm watching him do these things, and you can get it. I knew what he was doing there. As a dad, I'm watching him. I know he's, and, and here's what went into my mind when I'm watching all this. And, and his face, the little boy's face, went from being very disappointed to smiling and excited. That man had a choice to make in that moment because I just told you that sacrifice is the greatest love you can offer another person, friend, whoever. No doubt, because this boy looked like he was really trying to do some moves, okay? He just couldn't get it done, all right? Girl power or whatever, it happened, okay? He couldn't handle it. It looked like in this moment, I thought about that dad who had been taking his son to practice and had probably, I mean, really sacrificed to get his boy where he needed to be and had brought him out to this and his boy had an expectation of victory. He goes out, he gets defeated, he comes off and in that moment, that man had a decision to make. That he, and, and listen, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking that he'd roll up on his dad and his dad would be like, what was wrong with you? Like, I didn't expect that. But I was thinking about me as a dad, I might have been like, oh, buddy, that's, oh, Right? I'm with you. My heart hurts for you, and that makes me a good dad. Right? But that's not what he did. He smiled big and was encouraging through all the sacrifice and the disappointment that they must have been feeling at that moment. They still, he set the tone to smile about it and be encouraging. There is no reason we can't be that to each other all the time. There is no good reason we can't be that way. We can't, there's no good reason. Whatever excuse you come up with is just, it's, it's nothing, it's trash. Because we can be better to each other. In fact, God demands it. Greater love has no man in this that someone would lay down his life for his friends. That's what we get from a heavenly father. A life laid down. His father gave him all he had to give after that match. That's what God gave us. All we had to give. All we had to give. I want to show you this last little point. 
we got to let somebody in. Verse number 15, friends grow us by speaking the truth in love. Look at verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for that I have heard from my father. All that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Jesus says, everything God told me, I passed on to you. I have told you, there, there's no secrets here. Everything that God has told me, I've shared with you. Now, honestly, I want to tell you today that I don't think we are sharing and letting people all the way in our lives, people that we care about. I don't think we're doing it. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but I got a little bit of evidence. We live in a culture that really embraces social media. Did you know that? I don't know if you knew that or Raise your hand if you got some social media account at all. Just raise your hand. <laughs> Bam. Point proven. I'm just right, 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 right all over the place here today. Listen, let me share this with you. Social media is awesome for a lot of reasons, but it's terrible for this one. We get to see just little snapshots of each other's lives. And then we make this assumption that we know about them. And we don't. We get to see the best part of people's lives. But we don't get to see all the mess in between. In fact, sometimes, now I know what you're thinking, because everybody has that friend that will post something on social media, and it's really like a really veiled, passive-aggressive, mean thing to say, you know what I'm talking about? And if you don't have that friend, you that friend, all right? <laughs> Everybody's got one. We will see on just, we will see, we will wake up, and, and we'll see on social media, we'll see pictures, selfies of people like, living life to the fullest and loving it and friends and family dinners and all these wonderful things from this one person. And then the next hour, <laughs> one hour later, we will see a post like this right here. Like, don't you hate people that lie right to your face? You know who you are. <laughs> from that king, not that one. <laughs> you know, this is what I love about these posts because we've all seen posts like this, right? Uh, for, for on social media, if you have social media. What I love about this is it speaks to our culture that uh, you're allowed to see one extreme or the other. Those people that we call friends aren't really friends if this is all they know. <coughs> because a true friend will lay down their entire life for you. Their entire life will be laid down. That's not letting people in. Not really. I know you think it is, but it's not. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2 says this. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. One of my absolute favorite verses in the Bible right here. In fact, I've told you we're all wearing our softball shirts. Everybody gets to pick their own number. I picked the number 62 because this should be a verse that resounds in your heart all the time. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? I know when you think about the law, you think about maybe the Ten Commandments or maybe the over 300 Old Testament laws. No, that's not what this verse is talking about. It's talking about the law that Jesus set down. Two things. He said, above all the others, these two matter. You love God with everything you got. And you love each other like you love yourself. Bear one another's burdens and fulfill that law. That's how you do it. That's how you do it. Now that means we're going to start listening to each other, right? Mm -hmm. Right? We're alive this morning. Yes. we got to listen to each other. It means we're going we're gonna to do that without thinking bad thoughts about each other, right? Right. <laughs> it means we're going to keep each other's secrets. Right. <laughs> Perhaps I had a secret I was prepared to share. But after that really bad response, <laughs> they're going to stay at this pulpit. <laughs> no, we're going to speak the truth in love. Because listen, a true friend will tell you how it really is, but they'll do it with love in their heart and on their lips. If you think you have a friend and all they ever tell you is what you want to hear, you don't have a friend. Mm -hmm. You have a fan. Fans are great. They are. Love some fans, but fans won't grow you. Friends grow you because they tell you exactly what needs to be said, but they do it in love. You say, Pastor Mal, but I don't let people in. I get hurt. Yes. Can I share something with you? And this might be a secret to some of you. Let me just share it. Uh, 
people are mean. <laughs> okay? People are mean. You are people. Yes? Yes. We are mean. We have to be careful around people, but the problem is we become so careful we don't let people in. Can I share that if we want to change a culture of people being mean to each other, we start with ourselves. I want to share this verse with you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. In other words, my boy Thumper said it. If you ain't got nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. But it goes a step further than Thumper. See, Thumper had it. His mama had it, really, because that's who he was quoting. But it goes a step further, because Jesus says that's not good enough. Yes, definitely, don't tear people down, because we are awesome at that as a culture. If you, I mean, really, I'm going to stand at the back after the service, and I could just, as you went by, I could just like, insult you and insult you and insult you. And it would be no different than anything you get every single day. Jesus says that's not enough to keep your mouth shut. But he says, edify, which means build up, which means you have a responsibility to make other people understand that they are worth more than the trash that people make them feel like sometimes. You have a responsibility. Jesus led us all the way in. Here's the final verse I want to share with you, Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or the punishment for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. He led us all the way in. He led us all the way in. Can I share something with you? If you are waiting until you get older or if you're waiting until something happens in your life to start treating other people like Jesus treated other people, then you're going to wake up one day and the friends that you wanted or the friends you thought you had are going to be gone. I want to share this poem with you in closing. This poem was written by a man named Hanson Town. It's called Around the Corner. It says, Around the Corner I have a friend in this great city that has no end. Yet days go by and weeks rush on and before I know it, a year is gone. And I never see my old friend's face, for life is a swift and terrible race. He knows I like him just as well as in the days when I rang his bell. And he rang mine, and we were younger then. And now we are busy, tired men, tired with playing a foolish game, tired while trying to make a name. Tomorrow, I say, I will call on Jim just to show him I'm thinking of him. But tomorrow comes, tomorrow goes. And the distance between us grows and grows. Around the corner, yet miles away. Here's a telegram, sir. Jim died today. And that's what we get and deserve in the end. Around the corner, a vanished friend. By Hanson Town. The reason I like this poem is twofold. Number one, it tells us treat your friends good today. Because none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. And number two, the same is true when we think about God. <coughs> I'm going to settle everything when I reach a certain age. Or I'm going to settle everything, let me make all my money, and then I'll handle this God thing. Or, once God shows me he's real, I'll take care of it. Or, if God really loves me, then once I get there, he'll let me in. I told you last week I never met a Christian that said, I just got, you know, I just started following God too soon. Is miserable. <laughs> I've yet to meet one. But I've met people say, I wish I would have, oh boy, I wish I would have just accepted him earlier. That's right. I wish. Around the corner. How are you treating people today? Have you been challenged by that? Are you putting your faith in Jesus? Or are you putting it in Jesus' people? Because they're going to let you down, present company included. Let's trust in the one who gave everything. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes today for me?